And that's where I believe the black swans of St. James's Park come mm -hmm. from as well. That's okay. actually Natalie Portman. Hi guys, we're back. Sinead and Rob. On our final tour of Haunted London, today is Haunted Parks and Haunted Palaces. We're going to head to some of the most iconic sites in London. I'm going to take you to the most haunted place and the haunted house in London. Ladies and gentlemen, stay tuned. This is our last Halloween video, Happy our first stop on the tour, St. James's Park and the Headless Red Lady. Stay tuned. Okay, folks, so here we are at Queen Anne's Gate. And Queen Anne, of course, had a very tragic life. Although she had 17 pregnancies, only five led to live births. And of those five, the oldest lived only to the age of 11. Rob was telling me a story actually about afterwards, something to do with her rabbits. Yeah, well, very tragically, she also suffered ill health. They probably think it was lupus syndrome now. And I believe dropsy. Yeah, so dropsy. Talk about dropsy and, and she depression. Spent and... Depression. She spent the last few years of her life bed bound. She couldn't walk. And she had 17 bunny rabbits in her bedroom that were all named after the 17 children she sadly lost. I had never heard that. Yeah, so rather tragic. There's a film about her called The Favourite with Olivia Coleman. That's amazing. Um, Love it. Rachel Weisz as well. Mm -hmm. So yeah, just this poor tragic lady, bed bound, surrounded by these rabbits, a reminder of children she's lost. Um, there's actually a statue of her outside St Paul's Cathedral. Yes, there is. And the statue famously has its back to the door of St Paul's, because when she was alive, she came out as an atheist. Oh! Uh, because of oh. how horrible her life was, she basically said, I turn my back on God the way God has turned his back on me. So they called her Brandy Ann. <clears throat> they called she her Brandy, Brandy Ann, because she was a Brandy. Yeah, but that's why they... So they deliberately put a statue facing away from St Paul's Cathedral where normally royal statues outside religious buildings look straight down the middle, like down the door, through the door, down the aisle. That's so, absolutely yeah. amazing. I had no idea about that. That's fabulous. Unfortunately, though, they put her to facing towards a pub at the time. Well, no, she had a reputation for And there was a nursery lesson. rhyme. Poor Queen Anne, left in the lurch, face to the pub, back to the church. Oh, that's the one. Yeah, I remember hearing about that. But this, ladies and gents, is one of the oldest of eight royal parks. This is the beautiful St. James's Park. Now look at the colours. Isn't it magnificent? Gorgeous. You'll have seen this on my Westminster tour. But this area, hard to believe now, would have started out as swampy marshland and was used actually for pig farming. Ideal conditions for pig farming until Henry VIII converted it into hunting grounds. But the reason, James I actually kept a zoo here. Mm. And apparently there was crocodiles, camels, elephants. And we just left that main street there that we crossed a minute ago, folks. It's known as Birdcage Walk because that was named after an exotic aviary. Was it James I kept the exotic aviary there as well? Or was it yeah, Charles James I? Yeah, Charles II. Basically, oh, mm -hmm. the rule was if you were going to come and visit the country, you had to bring an animal from yours with it. That's with right. You, if you're a, as a gift for the monarch. As a gift it? for the monarch. That's so right. all the big animals got put in the Tower of London, like the lions, the tigers, the elephants. Very true. The smaller animals, particularly the birds, they were brought here to St. James's Park. That's right. But you can imagine in here crocodiles and... That uh, would be amazing. I There's mean, also, how incredible um, would it have been? But the one survivor from that time is the pelicans. That's that right. still live in St. James's Park. And they are descended from a pair of breeding pelicans that were a gift from the Tsar of Russia back that's in the 17th right, century. That's right, the Tsar of Russia. Yeah, that's right. And they're still here today. And that's where I believe the black swans of St. James's Park come mm -hmm. from as well. That's okay. actually Natalie Portman. She's been getting into her role for Black Swan 2. <laughs> of course and she, she comes down here, gets Trusts fully immersed. She's a black swan, yeah. of course she does. A bit of method acting. Right, enough of that. We need to get into... The reason this is one of the most haunted parks in London. And the story dates. Ooh. Oh dear. Oh my dear. <laughs> She's just seen a ghost. She's just seen the ghost of the headless red lady. Now, the story behind it involves a member of the army, I believe. He murdered yes. his wife. One of the household cavalry, the Queen's guards or the King's guards at the time. And he chopped off her head. And apparently, her head. He threw into the lake here, folks. Now, the sightings of her have been reported in the 1700s, 1800s, and even up to the 1980s. Now, one story says that she is often seen arising from this lake and drifting over this lake. Actually, 
purportedly in search of her missing head. But mm -hmm. Rob is another story for us. Well, yes, yeah, so she was the wife of a member of the Household Cavalry, and he apparently led her into the park one evening when she was wearing a rather splendid white dress. And he tricked her and he beheaded her, threw the head in the lake, and all of the blood pumped out of her neck, all down the front of her dress, turning her dress blood red. He dumped her in the lake, and now uh, she appears to military men normally. So if there were a military man walking through the park, uh, some say she rises out of the water trying to get a revenge because she can't. She thinks the military men are her husband, so she's trying to get her husband get a bit of revenge for her being murdered. Um, in and cold she, blood. In I cold mean, blood. What a brutal way to be murdered. And she often appears on this bridge known as the Blue Bridge, which is what we're crossing bridge. over right now. And actually, incidentally, in Wellington Barracks, as we're on the 3rd of January in 1804, at 1.30 a.m., a Lieutenant Colonel Jones of the Coldstream Guard reported seeing the figure of a woman without a head. And she rose from the earth in a distance about three feet before her just in a red striped gown, which we're assuming is that bloodstained gown, mm -hmm. uh, the figure appeared to envelope in a cloud. So another story involves a driver that was coming through the park here and he spotted a headless woman running across the road near Wellington Barracks. He actually swerved and they say she, he crashed into the... Well, there's a really funny story about that because it's the only time in British legal history that someone's got off of a driving van by blaming it on a ghost. Really? So he basically, he crashed into the Wellington Barracks, uh, 1970s, I think 73 or something like that. That's right, it was the latest, yeah, that um, was the latest sighting. So he crashed into the barracks, uh, he was arrested, they breathalyzed him, asked him if he was on drugs, and he was like, no, I was just just trying to avoid the, the lady the red in the, in the red dress. And he so, told, him, told him what had happened, this woman had stepped out into the road, um, and he'd swerved to avoid her, and that's what had made him smash into the, into the barracks. So what I wanted to explain to the customers is the reason we didn't do this at night time, folks, is because it's very dimly lit. Before we leave, Sinead, there's a great story about St. James's Park. Is there? Go on, tell so us. It's not a ghost story, but it's kind of a, an attacker story. There was this um, spate of attacks in the 1700s, between 1788 and 1790. In St. James's Park? In St. James's Park, in the surrounding areas, and this attacker became known as the London Monster. Oh. And he'd always attack women who were walking on their own. Um, he'd do stuff as trivial as literally kicking them in the, in the arse as they walked past, slapping them, pinching them, but then his attacks got more and more horrific. Um, he took to wearing boots with blades on the toe, and he'd go up behind a woman and kick her in the backside with this bladed shoe. Uh, he also carried around a bouquet of flowers with a blade inside it, and he'd offer it to women to sniff, and as they leaned in to sniff, oh, he'd no, thrust it in their face. Um, That's terrible. And he attacked 50 women over two years. Wow. And his attacking spree came to an end in 1790 at St. James's Park when there was a woman called Anne Porter, who had been one of his um, previous victims. She was taking a stroll with a friend of hers, saw this guy in the distance and went, That's him. So the friend took chase, caught up with this guy. The guy turned out to be a 23 year old Welshman called Rinnick Williams. Um, he was put on trial, he denied it was him, he said, no, it's not me, it's not me, it's not me. Um, but everyone thought, well, even his own lawyer said, it is him. Um, and he was put away for four years. My God. But the, uh, the stupidity of the situation was that women's rights back then were so small, that instead of the charge being attacking women or GBH, he was put away for the act of tearing someone's clothing. And that's, and what, that's, he got, what, he got that's what he got four years, years for. for, yeah. Wow. But a lot, a lot of people don't think it was him. They reckon he was just pinned on him. And the real London monster, whoever it was, obviously saw someone had been charged for it and either got spooked and thought, oh my God, I better stop doing this. Or they and thought, of course the police would have been under pressure to get someone. Yeah, or they yeah. thought, oh my God, someone's taken the blame. Fantastic. And they just stopped doing it. Ooh, oh, the wow, king is in, ladies and gents. Now, how do I know the king is in? I know because there are two soldiers stationed here now the changing of the guard took place this morning i did the changing of the guard tour now this is st james's palace the um, most official senior and royal working palace of them all buckingham palace is in the court of st james's palace and this palace was built by henry the eighth for his second wife anne boleyn 
But she famously never saw it in its completion, of course. She because had her head of, chopped off. At one of the most haunted places as well in London, the Tower of Tower. London. See link in description, folks, for our video on the Tower of London. Margaret does a wonderful job. <laughs> but the reason we're here, and we're getting sidetracked, <laughs> is the story of the Royal Valet, Joseph Sellers. Okay. So the story involves the haunting of St. James's Palace as of one of the royal valets by the name of Joseph Sellers. And we're going to go all the way back to the reign of King George III of England. Now, King George III had a son. His name was the Duke of Cumberland. So in the middle of the night on May 31st, 1810, Ernest Augustus, the Duke of Cumberland, was attacked while he lay in his bed. Awoken by an intruder in his room, the intruder began to slash at his body. Whilst trying to defend himself from the assault, his hands and wrists became badly cut. The assailant fled, and when the Duke called for assistance, his valet, Cornelius Neal, rushed in. But most notably absent was his other valet, Joseph Sellers. Now, when they went to look for Joseph Sellers, they found him in his room, dead with his throat cut so deeply his head was almost severed from his body. So the story goes is that the Duke had defended himself from an attack from his valet, Joseph Sellers, and some say he had gone completely and utterly insane and mad, and he went back to his room and he committed suicide, essentially. But there's been a lot of holes in the story over the years. Suspicion arose about the nature of his death. How could Sellers have possibly inflicted such horrendous injuries on himself in such a brutal way and why was he found with his hands free of any blood stains? So the rumor began that the Duke had in fact killed Sellers because he had found out some major scandal with regards to the Duke. So he had killed him to cover up the story. But Rob has a completely different story. And here is where the rumor mill goes into absolute overdrive. Well, the story, the story the story goes that the Duke enjoyed getting involved in lewd acts. So all of these slanderous stories will be made up about him. Um, allegedly, he was in a relationship with Cornelius Neal. The other valet. The other valet. And uh, Joseph Sellis found out that the Duke and Neal were having in a relationship together. And he was going to th he was threatening to release the information to the ah, newspapers. Ah, that's the scandal then. Okay. The scandal. So they allegedly, they set the attack up. Because the reason um, they thought it was Joseph Sellis was that a pair of Joseph Sellis's slippers had been discovered in the Duke's wardrobe as though... Coincidentally. As though Sellis had been hiding in there waiting for the Duke to be asleep. And then he'd attacked the Duke and left his slippers behind in the process. A little bit convenient, if you ask me. Very convenient. Also, the attack on the Duke was with the Duke's own sword. But the attacker hadn't sliced the Duke with the sword like you would normally do, they'd hit the Duke with the side of the sword's blade. Uh -huh. So instead of killing the Duke, it would merely injure him. So if you're going to attack someone to kill them, first thing you do is you get the sword He's the right way around. In the right, right way around, of course. So was the attack on the Duke set up? Did the Duke take some injuries in order to make it look as though Celis had attacked he had fought him? Off him. Yeah. yeah. I mean, well, that's the ghost that's said to haunt here. And in fact, he is said to walk around in here at night time with these horrific injuries clearly visible, his head lolling on his shoulder and a hideous wound gaping from his throat. Okay, guys, so we've just walked up the mall there and we will come back down here towards the palace in just a moment. But first, we're heading in here to what a place is called West Island, right on the lake in St. James's Park. I'm going to tell you a little bit more about the skeleton mm. of St. James's Park. Off you go, Rob. So, around about 20 years ago, 2001, 2002, um, there was a guy, an American guy called Robert James Moore, and he was a proper royal family fanatic. I mean, stalker esque. Stalker esque. Yeah, They'd often yeah. see him at the palaces, Balmoral, Sandringham. Mm. Um, and he kept mailing the Queen. He'd send letters to the Queen. And Listed packages. letters, though, wasn't it? it was well, very... they began pretty innocently. They began like, um, they were love letters, but they weren't letters saying, I love you. They were letters saying, I know you love me. Okay. Leave, okay. Philip, we'll run off together. Oh, wow. Um, okay. And over the years, they got more and more suggestive. And in just over 10 years, he sent 600 letters. Oh, my God. Yeah. To Her Majesty the Queen. Now, obviously, these were all mostly intercepted, but she knew what was going on, I'm sure. 
and then he just disappeared. He sort of vanished off the face of the earth. Uh, no more letters were received, and they thought the story was over until around about 2001, 2002, when the park wardens of St. James's Park, they went on this island. This island straight ahead, you West guys. Island. So West the, Island. Let's get a little view of it over here. So the thing about St. James's Park is it's a wildlife sanctuary. So they leave little bits of it completely alone so the birds can live in peace, in relative peace. peace yeah. one of, and this island is one of those places, but they do occasionally go on there every couple of years to tidy it up a little bit, maybe get rid of sort Prune of plastic the bags, et cetera, yeah. uh, trim the bushes. Um, so they went on there and they discovered a tent. Stop And it. when they undid the tent, they were hit by the stench of death, rotting flesh. And they discovered the skeleton of a man surrounded by an empty bottles of whiskey and vodka. Oh my God, stop. And uh, when they did tests on the skeleton, they found out it was none other and Robert James Moore, who had bought himself a tent, moved into what is effectively the Queen's front garden, and died about a hundred yards from Buckingham Palace. And he'd been there, they reckon, for three years. So I suppose you could say it's kind of romantic, you know, <laughs> dying in the front garden of the woman you love. Well, <laughs> minus the stalk a bit. Yeah, I afraid, minus yeah. the stalk a bit. Yeah, and the alcoholism and the... Oh. He's coming for some food. I have some food there for him in a minute. Ooh. So yeah, there's West Island. The ducks aren't having any of it. There's West Island, you guys. And that gives you a gorgeous view through there as well of the bridge we've just crossed over. The skeletal remains found right here in the Queen's Front Garden. Next up, folks, Buckingham Palace. So if you're enjoying the tour so far, go ahead and click that like and share button and help others discover this video. And for more virtual tours of London and beyond, consider subscribing to our channel. Be sure to visit our website to learn more about our in-person tours and London travel tips. We also offer live and virtual tours in cities throughout the world. You can help support this channel by donating through the thanks button or by buying your tour guide a pint or a cup of coffee. Links to do so are in the description below. Now back to the tour. Okay, guys, here we are with this amazing view of Buckingham Palace, built in 1702 by the Duke of Buckingham. However, it wasn't always Buckingham, well, it started out as Buckingham House, but on this site was also the site of a monastery. An enchained monk is said to haunt the rear terrace where a monastery once stood, but it's also said to be haunted by the private secretary of King Edward VII by the name of Major John Gwynne. He is also said to have stayed in the royal residence, and whilst there, he went through a very public and scandalous divorce, which of course was a huge scandal in royal society at the time. Uh, he is said to have shot himself in the bedroom, and to this day, Rob, you told me that he's that day he shot himself was Christmas, Christmas day, day, right? Yeah, yeah so Christmas day. Every year on Christmas day, they hear a phantom gunshot in Buckingham Palace. And I think the Queen had said to have reported it reputedly have heard of several ghosts in the palace as well. Uh, most of the palaces are said to be haunted, including Sandringham. You know about the Hampton Court Palace, folks. Check out our video on that. Uh, the Hampton Court Palace ghost, Tower of London is a palace. And they also say Anmere Hall, which is the royal residence now of the Prince and Princess of Wales. Prince William, of course, and Catherine Middleton. But we're gonna head straight in now towards Green Park, ladies and gents. Now, Green Park, Again, one of the eight royal parks was also on the site of a former leper hospital. Mm. You said that to me, wasn't it, Rob? Yeah, but there's uh, the reason it's called Green Park is there's no flowers. No formal flower beds there's there, all is just there? grass and trees. Um, and yeah, they reckon the reason for that is because it used to be a leper hospital and all the dead bodies would have been buried down there. And as a sign of respect, they've kind of left it not decorated it, just kind of left it as it is. But there is, what is the story you wanted to tell me here? There was some lady, crummy well, lady. Well, yes. So there's many, many ghost stories involving Green Park because of its history with the leper hospital and all, all the dead bodies that are buried underneath. You've also got a plague pit um, down towards the Hyde Park corner area. Close enough, Green isn't Park. it? Yeah, yeah. where the so thousands of unearthed plague victims were found. A, quite a few thousand bodies under Green Park. Um, some of the here. ghosts include the pig-faced lady. 
Oh my God. Now the pig faced lady apparently appears to young men in the dead of night. They'll be strolling through Green Park. See a young woman up against the tree in quite bad distress with her arm around her face, leaning into her arm, sobbing into the tree. So they go up behind her and they say, are you okay? Is there anything I can do? Damsel in distress though. And she apparently turns, whips around to face them, and she's got the face of a deformed pig. Oh my God. With uh, fangs dripping with saliva. And then oh. she squeals in their face before Do we have any background of her? No, no particular reason? No, it's just one of the many weird, wonderful stories that come out of Green Park. And so this is Green Park. Now Green Park, now this is a story I knew nothing about. Rob, you see, this is why it's ideal to have Rob with me because he does ghost tours in the area. Mm. So not only do we have the history of the leper hospital, the plague pit history, and also the pig-faced lady, what's the story well, of the tree? There's a tree in this park known as the death tree. Wow. And the story goes that you don't know which one it is until it's your time. Ah, I've heard many that pe now. Many people have often been found uh, hung from the trees here in Green Park. It's a suicide hotspot. But there's also a secondary story that's linked to the death tree. And that is the fiddler of Green Park. Ooh. And by fiddler, I mean violinist, of course. A violinist. Okay. Yes. Um, so that story involves the death tree. I'll explain why in a second. So this fiddler was a young boy, about sort of 10, 11, 12 years old, uh, homeless, used to come down the Green Park with his violin every day and he'd fiddle away and all the rich people from the West End would stroll through and they'd give him a couple of coins. Uh, one night he hadn't made much money, so instead of going and finding himself somewhere to stay, a DOS house maybe, uh, he ended up just laying on one of the benches and fell asleep. When he woke up, his fiddle was gone. Now, this was all he had in the world. So he spent the next week or so coming to Green Park every day, looking around, begging people in the streets and the aisles and the, and the paths here, have you seen my fiddle? Please help me, please help me. And then one day he had the misfortune of dropping to his knees and screaming into the ground, I will do anything to get my fiddle back. And then he walked off. And the ground he just screamed into was right next to the death tree. Oh, bless So him. the death tree took this as a job application. So the next time the little boy came back to the park, foggy day, you could barely see your hand in front of your face, he heard this fiddle music in the distance. He was like, oh my God, that's, that's my fiddle. So he follows it, it gets louder and louder and louder. Then he sees his fiddle up in the branches of one of these trees. Oh my God, no way. So he climbs the tree and he's reaching for the fiddle, reaching, reaching, and suddenly the branch snaps and he oh, falls to his, his death. death. And they say now that that fiddler of Green Park is now attached to the death tree because the problem with the death tree is it's a tree so it can't go walking around claiming souls willy-nilly the souls have to come to it so what it really needed was some kind of siren to lure people oh. to come in so now the death tree uses that poor young boy's spirit and his artistic skills with the fiddle of the fiddle to lure people towards it so when he screamed into the ground i'd do anything to get my fiddle back the death tree took that as a job application for his new siren. So technically, if you sit under the tree, it claim takes your life. Is that, is that what the rumor is? They reckon so, yes. Or that you get lured kind of in some kind of trance-like state in the dead of night and you end up sort of climbing the tree and jumping off of it or... The scary thing about it is not knowing which one it is. Yeah, you don't know until it's your time, apparently. So, dare you take a little nap if underneath the dead tree of Green Park? If that one come, looks suspiciously it does. over there, doesn't it? It's very I'm purple, doesn't it? I'm going with that one there, you guys. If you hear the music of a fiddle in Green Park in the dead of night, do not Do not it. approach. And you see a crying woman? Well, maybe do approach just in case and take your chances. But you also get, um, people have seen like Victorian mourners walking around, like old ladies in black. Victorian dress. Black Victorian dress, sort of sobbing and holding flowers and well, stuff like that. Well, we know this, the Victorians were obsessed with death. Yeah and the actual celebration of death because they believe the more elaborate the funeral the more welcome the passage into mm. heaven they used to take those creepy photos of dead people as well because they believed it would preserve their their memory and their soul 
Oh, that's right. Um, to take the photos with the family around yeah, the, the fam- so That's they'd right. They pose the dead body as though they were still alive and just oh, have a little snooze. Oh, God, I know. That's, I've got a chill down yeah. my spine thinking of some of the ones I've seen. Well, now that's the spirits of Green Park, folks. And next, we're going to head into the heart of Mayfair. Ladies and gentlemen, I am taking you to the most haunted house in London, the terrifying 50 Barclay Square. Okay, guys, so we've made it here to Barclay Square, which I had mispronounced in my previous Mayfair video. And we do this area in much more in depth in the Mayfair video. So check that out, you guys. And I want to show you first, just to give you a hint of what's ahead of us. Now, this is Annabelle's, the private members only club. It's a 4,000 people strong waiting list to get inside the door here. Very strict dress code. Um, very famous members only club. You will have seen that in my Mayfair video. It was stunningly done. And I'll be coming back here for Christmas videos, which will be starting very shortly. But the reason we're here is this terrifying place. We're heading down here to the former home of the Prime Minister George Canning. This is 50 Barclay Square, said to be the most haunted place in London. In fact, the legends of 50 Barclay Square are numerous, and we'll start with the first one. The most persistent is that it was haunted by something so dreadful that it could frighten people to death. So this is the former home of George Canning, and the most haunted place is said to be the attic, right at the top of the building. So the story refers to a maid. She's instructed to open up the unused haunted room and to get it ready. But she goes completely mad as a result of something she has seen in there. The apparition was said to have been almost like a sea life creature with tentacles that came at her. And she died not long after in the hospital of complete and utter shock, going to her grave without ever explaining to anyone what she saw inside the building. We're gonna go all the way back to 1789. And this story centers around a young little girl that lived in here and her name was Adeline, who was terrorized by her uncle, terrorized with physical and sexual abuse. She is said to have thrown herself from um, the top floor and impaled herself on the railings below uh, to escape the unwanted advances of her uncle. Now, every now and then, apparently the apparition of this girl appearing in the window and disappearing happens quite frequently. Now, it's also suggested that a child was murdered by her nanny inside this building. And when George Canning, the Prime Minister, lived here, it is said he kept a journal of haunted experiences, including banging noises and sounds of movements in the house. That will take us then to the 1850s and a gentleman by the name of Thomas Moore, a jilted lover and the inspiration for one of the greatest characters in Charles Dickens' books, Great Expectations, Miss... Havisham. Now, in Great Expectations, Miss Havisham is a woman abandoned at her wedding, and she lives out the rest of her life in an empty house, trying to preserve her root youth and innocence while progressing into insanity. Now, direct links have never been made specifically between Thomas Myers and Miss Havisham. However, um, he did live at Berkeley Square whilst this book was being written by Charles Dickens. Now, Thomas Myers, again, the same story, lived in the building on his own as a recluse after being jilted in the, at the altar by his lover. He is said to have descended into horrendous periods of insanity. And the only time he was ever seen, the, the building went into serious disrepair, which became very obvious in the area, of course, amongst the elite houses here and the beautiful homes. Um, the only time he was seen was when he opened the door to let his staff in who had taken care of him and he took to uh, sleeping always during the day and only appearing at night time by candlelight. But some suggest he took part in the dark arts in the basement of the building and they believe that these dark arts had awoken the sea-like creature that was to become the main vision inside the building for years later. Okay, so the story then uh, comes to a chap called Robert Warboys in the 1850s. Apparently he died after his shock, of shock after his experience inside 50 Barclay Square. That night that led to his death, he had, he had requested to be left alone and he said he would ring a bell once if he expected any activity, but he would ring the bell twice if he needed any help. So the bell rang twice and it was reputed 
He was found dead in the building, in the bed, in the attic, with a terrifying look of shock on his face. Now, another chap called Lord George Littleton um, and his drinking buddies, they stayed in the attic, but he saw, he said, a figure in the darkness in the middle of the night, and he reached for his gun. He shot his gun and swore he saw this figure drop to the floor in front of him, but no evidence corroborated that story the following morning. He is said to have died himself by taking his own life four years later. But I suppose the most recent story involves two sailors, and Rob is going to tell us a little bit more about the sailors of Berkeley Square. Uh, these two sailors, they stayed in the attic, and then they allegedly saw the ghost of Thomas Myers lunging for them in the dead of night. So they both ran, one of them tripped as he ran, fell down the stairs and died. And the other one thankfully survived, but he did go on to tell people that the ghost of Myers had spooked him to such an extent. And, and that days, is... They don't, they don't um, let people up there anymore, it's now uh, an archive. Well, um, it's actually, I think, is it the bookstore? I thought it was Madge's bookstore, rare so bookstore, it seems to have moved out. They stuff in the attic, they deliberately don't let people in there anymore because of all the death. The, uh, just the reputation that it's gathered over the years, pretty much. There's, all, there's even a show in the London Dungeon based on 50 Berkeley Square. Oh, is there at the moment? Yeah. So 50 Berkeley Square, the most terrifying house in London. Oh. Right, ladies and gents, that's us finishing up our little Halloween segment. We really hope you enjoyed our tours over the last three weeks, folks. We've had an absolute ball during them. Say happy Halloween, Rob. Happy Halloween. From me and Rob, ladies and gentlemen, we're signing out here at the beautiful Berkeley Square in Mayfair. Thanks for joining us and as ever for your amazing comments. Hope you have a wonderful, scary, spooky time. Uh, thanks guys for tuning in. Sinead here with Free Tours by Foot London with my buddy Rob. You'll see him again in a couple of months time. Uh, it's been great. I hope you enjoyed it and happy Halloween everyone. Don't forget to leave in the comments where you'd like us to visit next. Um, if you'd like to buy us a drink, of course, we are heading for one. You can do so with our PayPal links below. Any private tour requests you may have, I'm always happy to show you around privately, ladies and gents. Thanks for joining us. Sinead here with Free Tours by Foot London.